very useful. This is joint work with with Caracos Camarena uh, from from Loyola University of Chicago, and I am I am Thomas. Okay, so we see this this common narrative that the U.S. is polarized among many dimensions, and one of the dimensions in which the U.S. is is polarized it's in its attitudes towards unauthorized migration. This polarization can be seen both in terms of of geography. Um, this this article by the Economist captures this these divergence, but also in terms of attitudes um, within or between parties, sorry, um, the um, opinions of, of Democrats and Republicans are quite different. Um, and both in terms of, of the relevance of, of the problem and whether they, they think it's a problem in the first place, and in terms of what should be done uh, to address this, this, uh, this problem, this issue. right? However, it's unclear whether these attitudes that we observe mostly in surveys um, depend on actual immigration flows, meaning places that receive more or less migrants display on average different attitudes, and whether these, these opinions have translated into different politics, different political outcomes, and different electoral outcomes. So what we're going to do in this paper is to answer how has Mexican unauthorized migration shaped the local political landscape in the US, right? How has this inflows affected political life in the US? You're gonna see why local, this, this is highly dependent on, on our identification strategy, but we just think that it's a better way to capture what's happening in the US. Why is this a relevant question? Well, first, because unauthorized um, migrants are a subset, around 40% of the largest diaspora on Earth, right? Mexicans living in the U.S. are the la largest diaspora on Earth. Around 40% of them do not have um, regular immigration status. And by Mexicans living in the U.S., I mean Mexico-born people. Okay, there are many uh, second generation, many more second generation Mexicans, but I, I saw them in um, Mexico-born um, individuals. Second, because this is a very politically salient group. Think of think of uh, how the former president launched his campaign. Think about the recurrent um, fixation of certain networks on on caravans. Not all of them Mexican, but but again, this is a, a very sizable group. And third, because this is a theoretically unique group, unauthorized migrants are not really uh, can really be characterized neither as regular migrants, transient migrants or refugees, but a, but a combination of, of, of them three, or, or it has fe they have features of, of the three of them. So in this paper, we're gonna focus on five sets of outcomes, actually four, the last one, uh, which is gonna present the table, but four sets of outcomes. Two of them are our are, are main outcomes, the, the political and the policy response to migration. So we, we, we study the effect on the vote share for the Republican party, and here we follow the literature, right? The Republican party in the last years being a party with marked anti-immigration attitudes, particularly anti-Mexican immigration attitudes. Uh, and then we, we study the effect on the provision of, of local public goods um, in levels and compositions. And the way to do this is we look at, at expenditures at the local level, all of the local political entities in the US, counties, uh, cities, townships, special districts, um, expenditures, aggregate expenditures and see how they change with, with unauthorized uh, Mexican migration. And to study uh, mechanisms, we look at, we follow, we follow the literature in, in focusing on economic effects. Here we study wages, employment, mostly formal employment, um, unemployment, household median income, and poverty. We also do something, something novel. We study uh, values. Um, there's, there's a growing literature studying um, the, the political dynamics of moral values. In particular, Benenke has, has a, a good paper on what, what he calls universalist versus communalist. And these are a set of values that capture uh, morality in people. And, and the idea is that some people prefer to assign or to give rights and services to a larger group of people. And some other prefer to just um, give goods to to the in-group, right? To people that look like them or that belong to the same religion or, or, or just ethnic group in general. So we study that as well, and crime. Um, a priori, it wasn't clear what to expect. 
there there is a broad consensus in the literature. There is a recent literature review by um, Alberto Alessina and Marco Taolini that says that immigration triggers um, natives' backlash. This is the general um, finding and favors right-wing conservative parties. However, a number of recent papers provide a more nuanced uh, picture. So maybe um, immigration may move native preferences to the left, increasing their openness to, to, to diversity. So again, although uh, a broad body of, of, of research suggests a, a, a backlash, it's unclear, right? It, it, was, it was theoretically unclear from the beginning. How do we measure um, unauthorized Mexican migration and how do we claim to, to identify a causal link? So we have official data on Mexican nationals living in the US who obtain a consular ID. I'm going to explain why people do this and, and what is a consular ID between 2002 and 2020. Um, these data said records the municipality of origin of, of people that get the, the ID and the county of residence. So, so you can think of, of, of shift share right there of, of networks. Um, so what we do is we predict uh, migration at the county level. That's, that's where the local comes from using two different shift share strategies. So all of the um, estimates that you're going to see has, we present OLS and, and the results of these two different shift share strategies. Both have the same shares, they share, they share the shares. Um, and these shares are the initial shares of migrants from Mexican municipality M in US County C, right? Think about the number of people from Mexico City that go to LA County and then to Ventura County and Cook County and all of them, those are the initial shares. And we have different shifters, two different shifters. One is, is a classic leave one out, a jackknife if, if you will. And this is basically, we, we calculate uh, the number of immigrants from municipality M, Guadalajara, Mexico, net of those that settle in the counties uh, core based statistical area. The core based statistical area is a larger um, geographic unit. So we're saying, okay, we are we are the the, the inflow of migrants, the, the the push of migrants that we're sending, that we're that we're interacting with the shares are just those that we see migrating from that city, except for those that actually went to the county that we're interested in. Okay. A classic leap one out. And the second shift share strategy that we use is a push factor shift share strategy in which we try to not only you know, leave the, the, the county of interest out, but actually predict the, the emigration from, from each Mexican municipality. And we do this using um, a set of 10 varying Mexican municipality uh, variables like poverty, economic activity, temperatures, and, and that. So what we do there is again, we try to say, okay, we see that in this period, there were you know, a thousand um, migrants from Guadalajara. Let's try to use all of the variables in our power to predict how many of those actually uh, migrated. And then we interact that that predicted immigration with the shares. And that measure of, of um, predicted migration at the county level in the US uh, is then matched with, with our outcomes of interest. Again, vote shares, expenditures, and um, economic uh, and, 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 and values. So a quick preview of the results. Since the the inflows are are tiny, right? A share of county populations. There, there, are, there are not that many unauthorized Mexican migrants. We scale this to make them um, intuitive and, and and to understand the magnitudes in two different ways. In green, you're going to see uh, the mean inflow of unauthorized migrants. So this is um, basically beta hat times x bar, right? Um, what well, what is the effect? of a mean inflow of unauthorized Mexican migrants. And the other one is just a regular standardized coefficient. So what we find is that inflows of unauthorized Mexican migrants increase the vote share of the Republican party by 3.9 percentage points. This is a very large um, effect, right? Um, we see lower spending on education, which is the largest spending at the local level in the US and higher relative spending in, in policing and the administration of justice, meaning more law and order, right? You can see that this is a consistent, uh, consistent uh, conservative response because we have conservative electoral outcomes and conservative policies. Why does it happen? Well, we think that this happens because this particular migration decreases formal employment in construction and hospitality and leisure, which are 
migrant intensive sectors right so so this inflow of migrants displaces formal employment in only these two sectors we don't put it here but we see uh, an increase in employment in formal employment in manufacturing which is not a migrant intensive sector so there's some displacement but we think that the backlash comes comes from this we see a significant increase in the poverty rate at the county level four percent increase uh this is um a large coefficient you, you see the standard as coefficient is not as large as the ones that we observe in our main outcomes but it's but it's large um we see an increase in out migration people leave the counties where they're uh, where they live and a declining universalist values this we we interpret as an out group um bias people people just dislike uh, individuals that are, are not in their in their group and we find suggestive evidence that the reaction all this reaction is weaker in counties with more progressive taxation or more generous safety nets so the conceptual framework that we have we don't have a theory uh, but we think that this is this that like um figure captures what we what we think right more newcomers less employment in construction and hospitality more poverty now in counties with higher poverty rates we see a more steep declining universalist values right and in counties with less poverty rate, we see increased out-migration, meaning counties that are not super affected by poverty see more out-migration as a response to an authorized Mexican migration. And all of these causes, an increase in the GOP vote share, a reduction in, in expenditure in education, and an increase in the in expenditure in, in law and order. Okay. We think we have four contributions to the literature. First, we specifically study the impacts of an authorized migration. Who are knowledge? There's little to none uh, written about specifically unauthorized migration. Second, we document both electoral and policy reactions in the same paper. There are papers that have documented uh, both of them separately, but we do this uh, together. Uh, and again, for unauthorized migration, we, the papers that we know, uh, Piri, Maidan, Steingras, and, and uh, Maidan, Sins, and, and Steingras, they do this for what they call low skill uh, migrants and high skill migrants, but separately. We do them in the same paper for this uh, population. And we test and adjudicate among multiple, multiple mechanisms, as I show you, economic, uh, more cultural and more demographic, or more moral and more demographic. And the looking into moral values is something that we haven't seen in the literature yet. And finally, we provide suggestive evidence to mitigate backlash against migration. Against migration, so we present a diagnosis uh, of an issue, and we we hint at uh, possible solutions. Okay, so our data, um, the consular identification is it's an ID that certifies that the people that the person that has is the cardholder lives in the constituency of the consulate. There are fifty one consulates in the U.S. Mexican consulates in the U.S. That is if. Uh, if you're not familiar with the size of the Mexican community, that is quite a lot, um, and the community is large, and the presence of the Mexican state in the U.S. is pretty large as well. So people in these consulates go and get an ID, and this ID is useful for the most part for unauthorized migrants because they have no access to formal IDs issued by the U.S. They do not have a regular status in the U.S., so that's why they, they go to the consulate to get one of these. Um, Think about it. If, if, if you can get a, a US uh, issued ID, you, you wouldn't get this. It's not particularly useful. Um, and importantly, this working assumption is one that is shared by many papers that have used these data set in the past. Um, and I'm going to present evidence that this is a sensible um, and, and think an appropriate um, assumption. It's easy to obtain this, this consular ID. You just need proof of nationality, address, identity, and, and to pay $35. It's valid for five years. This is important for, uh, for the way that we construct the, um, the endogenous variable. And the version that we have, as I said, we have individual level data with individual ID. We do not see the name of the person, but we can track people over time, which is useful, right? Because people renew their IDs, so we can tell when is the first time that that person is seen in the data set and we don't uh, over count uh, migrants. We have US County of Residence and Mexican Municipality of Origin, which is what will allow us to, to construct the networks. 
In total, after after the effort of cleaning these data set, we have we see 7.4 million people and around 14 and a half million observations. This large data set. And as I said, it goes from 2002 to 2020. This is how we, we create our, our endogenous variable. So as I said, the construct ID is valid for five years. So we assume we give people to show up in our data set, we give them five years, right? We say, okay, if you show up in the first five years, we count you as a newcomer. They might not be a newcomer, but that's the first time that we see them there, okay? So we use these years as shares. Since we don't have historic shares, we use the first five years. So we say anyone that we see, we see here, we count as, as part of the shares. And by year six, meaning 2007, every time we see a new person either in the data set or in the county, in this case, the CDSA, again, we're, we're being a little bit conservative, we're taking a larger unit. Every time we see um, a person in, in, in that uh, CBSA or in the data set, we count that person as, as a newcomer, right? This is a person that just recently arrived. And we do this in periods of, of four years. This is because, again, this allows us to be to give people some time to to enter into a data set since the, since the consular uh, data uh, the consular ID is valid for five years and also it aligns well with with the electoral cycle in the U.S. Right, elections in 2010 and 8, 12 and 14, and 16 and 18. So so this aligns well. Um, the main assumption here is that migrants stay in the same county during this period. Right, if we see someone for the first time in 2008, we assume that the person is going to be there. 2010. So the the the, um, the values that we have is we we uh, assign values for 2010, 14, and 18. So that's why we say okay by 2010, how many unauthorized migrants were there? Importantly, we're starting only um, changes and not not levels. We're not starting stocks, right? Because modeling stocks would be hard. We would have to, and this has done in the past, but it has it is, it is very sensitive to, to the assumptions that people make. Um, okay, how do we count a person that is renewing a, a, a consular ID? Uh, how much should we weigh that? We're just saying, okay, how many newcomers? And that's why that's why um, we, we make, we emphasize that. And we don't use the last two years of data. So see the national evolution of, of the flows, again, of newcomers. This is consistent with uh, what other people have found in other data sets, um, a consistent decline in, in the number of recent unauthorized Mexican migrants from 2 million to less than one in, in 2018. Okay. Remember, this is the last year of the period. So that's what we use for, um, for, for, um, for our, our strategy. And this is a map of recent unauthorized Mexican migrants, a share of county population, which is gonna be our 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 um our, our x um this is some um, every time i see this map I, I i find new and interesting things but probably one of the most interesting things is that we see at least it was very surprising to me to see a very high share of, of unauthorized mexican migrants in, in states like like south carolina um and and some in in, in florida uh, in, in the deep south, and, and clearly we see nothing in, in the north part of, of the U.S. Uh, there's a question I might have answered. Um, yeah, how representative are there? Good, good question. I'm gonna I'm gonna go into why we think this data set is uh, is relevant. It's a good data set. So data validity, precisely. The the literature has used other other data sets to measure what they call low skill or unauthorized migrants. And this data set, these estimates correlate very strongly with those ones. So the America community, American Community Survey is the main data set. So here we use two different sources for the American Community Survey. One um, is uh, comes from the Social Explorer and the other one is, is from IPUMS. Here we only have 400 counties. Here we have um, all of them, 2,674. And we see how strongly correlated these measures are. This is the log of population of unauthorized Mexican population using these two data sets. You see that these are very highly correlated. It's not that we are measuring something completely off base. Um, importantly, these data sets do not identify the municipality of origin of, of, of the Mexican migrant, just that this is a Mexican migrant, right? So our data set is, is superior in that regard. It has way more detail 
not only this is the case in terms of numbers, but they, they, they are very similar in terms of characteristics. Again, if we use uh, ACS5 only from, from IPUMS, um, this is the, the distribution of certain variables that we have and that are comparable. The proportion of, of, of females, the proportion of never married or single, and the age. Um, these are uh, standard deviations, uh, the standard error, sorry, the standard deviations, sorry. Um, we see that if we use only the 40, 441 counties, the same ones, the differences are, I mean, in this case, this is an economic, this is a statistically significant difference just because we have a lot of observations, but you know, here, for example, but economically it's meaningless, right? This is basically the same, the same population. Um, importantly, one may think, well, probably you're picking up certain um, certain migrants and, and probably uh, there is some sort of um, selection in, in your data, right? What, what happens or what if there are some changes at the local level that would affect the demand for, for consular IDs, right? Say that a state or a county becomes very harsh against migration, then people in that state or in that county would not go to, to, to get a consular ID and therefore we would not be observing, we would not be approximating the true level of uh, of newcomers. Well, we do we test this in two different ways. We see what happens after a state um, allows the consular ID to be used uh, as a, as a valid ID for uh, to get a driver's license in the U.S. Right. So what happens after that? We would expect a, an increase in the demand for consular IDs because now it's relatively more valuable. Um, and we do see that, actually, we see that even from a period before, but this effect dissipates over time. And since we control by state by period fixed effects, then this would, would our specification would take care of, of, of these changes. And we see a similar exercise with uh, county level uh, policy changes that might affect the demand for, for consular IDs. And this, this data set picks up variation primarily on an authorized Mexican migrant, mean, meaning it predicts um, unauthorized Mexican migrants, the presence of unauthorized Mexican migrants way more than authorized Mexican migrants, right? We do, we do uh, um, a first stage here uh, using ACS5, like how well our instrument would, would predict, um, our measure of, of unauthorized migrants would predict authorized and unauthorized migrants from the other data set. And we see that for the most part, it predicts unauthorized migrants. Um, okay, so hopefully I have convinced you of, of the validity of this data set. So now we go to the next one yeah. quick question. And have you think if maybe it's um, also correlated with measures of unauthorized, unauthorized migrants from other uh, Central American countries like Salvador, Honduras, or? Yeah, like yeah, no, pro it's probably correlated. Um, but 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 it would have to be. I think the way that we construct uh, our measure would have to, like our shares would have to be correlated exactly in the same the same way with municipalities of origin there, because we're not using pool factors. We're using push factors. So our endogenous variable is surely correlated, no doubt. Our x, but we're not super concerned because we're trying to uh, tease out migration from pool factors, the one that we just observed here, right? This one with migration based on networks. And that one surely not correlated with what happens. Yeah, with migration I'm, not sure, I'm not so sure. They could be also a correlation in the initial shares. So in order for the that networks. to be, yeah, for, in order for that to be the case, right? What, what would that mean? That would have to be the case that the distribution of shares in other countries would have to be similar and the evolution would have to be similar. But remember that we're using time varying here, time varying municipality of origin um, values to predict migration. So those would have to also apply to municipalities in Central American countries. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we, I see we're not deeply concerned. Um, we control for, for something similar in our robustness check. Um, yeah, we find we find nothing, but 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 yeah, maybe we need to be okay. uh, more explicit fine. Fine. Just, in, in testing that. So 
two identification strategies. The first one is, is uh, both of them are shift shares. The first one is a leave one out. This is inspired by, by Marco Tablini's paper. Here we see um, the first stage. Uh, well, first, how we construct the, the instrument, the instrument C, um, which is um, um, predicted migration, county C, state S at time T. And as I said, this is um, the interaction between the initial tier of migrants from Mexican municipality M times the, the leave one out, right? Here, this is the total number of migrants from Mexican municipality M in period T that migrated to the US, net of those that migrated in the counties, CBSA. An easier way to put it is all of the migrants from Guadalajara, that if we want to, to know how many, want to estimate the number of migrants from Guadalajara that arrived in, in LA County, well, here would be all of the migrants that migrated from Guadalajara in that year, minus the ones that migrated to LA County. This would be O. So O varies. This is specific of every county, right? Um, or every CBSA. So we interact this with, with initial shares and we divide this by predicted, micro, uh, predicted population because population is itself an outcome of interest. We, we construct a, a number of predicted population. At the county level, we use this, this instrument in our first stage to, um, to predict the observed number of, of recent Mexican migrants. We control by US county fixed effects and by state by peer fixed effects. And with this uh, predicted value, we, um, we reverse this predicted value on our, on our outcomes of interest. And again, we only control by county fixed effects and state by peer fixed effects. The standard errors are closer at the, at the CBSA level. The second shift here strategy is one that shares the initial or has the same initial shares, but instead of using the leave one out, we predict migration from every Mexican municipality in every period, right? So we have a zero stage here. This is predicted migration. And the zero stage here we use, um, as I said, a set of, of time variant Mexican municipality characteristics. Among them, social development, deaths, economic variables, temperature, we throw pretty much everything that we that we can find there. This is a prediction exercise. Uh, we have around like 50 regressors. We use first um, lasso, the Poisson regression. We don't want to uh, have negative values. So we select pretty much all of the all of the uh, um, variables except for one. And we have our measure of predicted migration that we use to construct the instrument. Um, these are the 15 more relevant, uh, most relevant regressions from, from our last of Boson regression. Uh, you see, right, temperature, population, sure of people that cannot read or write, some of them squared, uh, poverty rate, neonatal death. Again, these are, it would be hard that these are, are, are shared in the same, in the same way by, by other municipalities in different countries. Um, okay. I am, we're probably not going to have time to go over the uh, numeric examples, but uh, please let me know if, if this is unclear. So our identifying assumptions. First, let me be very explicit the type of, what, what is it, the type of variation that we exploit? We exploit within state period, those are the state period, county changes, right? So we're seeing how counties change within the same state and, and, and period, right? We claim exogeneity via in, in our shift shares via the leave one out or the Mexican municipality variables in the shifters. Those are our two shifters. Right? And our identifying assumptions, three, first that we have a first stage, which we do, I'm going to show you. And then uh, the exclusion restriction in our cases that predicted migration impacts the outcome of interest only via observed migration. And remember, since we're studying changes, this is similar to a parallel trends assumption meaning that the con conditional and the fixed effects, absent the predicted number of migrants, the differences in the outcomes of interest between counties would remain constant, okay? We're not exploiting cross-sectional variation, we're exploiting changes. And then monotonicity, which I think in our case is, is rather easy to attempt. So this is our first stage. We have very strong first stage. I'm presenting four different uh, specifications from least conservative to more conservative. First, in the first one, we leave the county itself out when we when we do the the, the leave one out. First, we leave the CBSA out and then the state out. Meaning, we're we are um, 
removing more and more migrants from the ones that we that we use for to calculate inflows. Okay? And then we use the push factors. And you see that that we uh, we underestimate migration, but not by a lot. It's, it's close to one. So we're doing a good job predicting um, Mexican migration. Actually, not us. Networks. This what what this tells us is that networks are very powerful. People go to where their um, peers or people from their their uh, municipalities go in the U.S. So main results. The first three columns. Well, before that, panel one is just the regular OLS. Panel two is the leave one out. And as I said, we present just the general coefficient, then the standardized coefficient, and then what I said that is the, the effect at, at the mean inflow of migrants, which is beta hat, this one times x bar um, dependent variable, independent variable, I mean, right? Half a percent uh, of, of population. What this means is that on average, an average US county in this period has 0.4% of its population being unauthorized Mexican migrants. Four out of a thousand people are recent unauthorized Mexican migrants. It's actually not that little. It's, it's, it's a large number. It's not huge, but, it, but it's large. So we see, as I said, um, significant effect on the voter for the Republican Party in the midterm election, 3.9 percentage points, slightly less, um, slightly smaller effect on on, on presidential years, again, probably because the president drives a lot of this vote share, and um, also a smaller effect on, on the vote share for the, for the Republican president. And here, as I said, we um, condense all of the expenditures at the local level in the US, cities, counties, townships, and special districts, and we take the, uh, the log of per capita, Right, of education, police, and the judiciary, and then the share that these represent of, of direct expenditures. And we see a 5% decrease in education expenditure, 4% increase in police, and 15% increase in judiciary, which actually is like 3%, 2%, and 8%. A very consistent um, conservative response. And here is a share of direct expenditure. We see that uh, an increase of 123 percentage points and 15%. So our results are robust to pretty much all of the uh, recent tests that, that, that the literature has uh, identified, inclusion of a simulated instrument, adao colesal morales like standard errors, meaning standard errors that are correlated by the shares, inclusion of stocks, inclusion of spatial lags, exclusion of outliers, no population weights, and then using only variation within similar counties in the same state. So, so reducing the amount of variation that we're explaining. Very importantly, we see null effect on lagged outcomes. Um, and we have not really done um, the Rottenberg weights, but the number of migrants is not strongly spatially correlated and the network concentration is not that bad, meaning we don't see all of the migrants coming from a couple of municipalities in Mexico. Migrants come from a bunch of municipalities in Mexico. So this is not the effect of just what's happening in Guadalajara, Monterrey, and in Mexico City. And the effects are consistent across the political spectrum. There's no really big heterogeneity by what happened in the previous election or by whether the county has a high share of um, black population or white population or Hispanic population. These effects are rather consistent. So mechanisms in, in four minutes. Ernesto, Ernesto, sorry, you have five minutes left. Yeah, in four minutes, good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rush. So we see impacts on migrant intensive sectors. Here, uh, we use a quarterly census of employment and wages to study form, this is formal employment mostly, it's total in construction, manufacturing, hospitality and leisure, and leisure, this is services and agriculture, and these are wages, right? This is log per working age population. Consistent decrease in construction and hospitality and leisure, which, has, which are migrant intensive sectors, very interestingly, and almost equally sized impact, positive thing, impact on manufacturing. So we see some, some change in, in sectors here, basically nothing in, in wages, right? Which is consistent with economic theory. This is just effect on formal employment. But we see an increase in, in informal employment, which we cannot, which we cannot uh, see here, right? Um, we see, a, as I said, a 
a very steep increase in poverty, nothing on GDP per capita, nothing economically significant or statistically significant GDP per capita, median household income, or employment rate. But we do see an increase, significant increase, a 4% increase in the poverty rate. People say, well, is this just a, um, an artifact of unauthorized Mexican migrants being poor and they themselves increasing the poverty rate? Well, if we look at the rate of SNAP recipients, you have to be a citizen to receive SNAP, the, the supplemental. Um, I forgot what SNAP stands for, um, but it's but it's the, uh, um, the anti-poverty federal program in the US and increase as well. So this is affecting citizens too. Um, a decrease in, in total population of 1%, which is almost entirely explained by out-migration, nothing on Republican identity or, ide or ideology. This is just because we don't really have good data, I think, on, on ideology and, and, and identity. And by good data, I mean data for the whole country. We do see a decline, significant decline in, in universalist values, meaning an out-migration, an out-group bias. People become more inwards and prefer to keep traditions and, and reward goods and services to, to, to their own um, kind. Um, our migration and universalist values seem to be, as I said, substitutes. In places with above median poverty rate, we see a more steep decline in universalist and places with below median poverty rate, we see more uh, out migration. And finally, there's suggestive evidence of weaker effects in counties uh, with uh, with more progressive tax structures. So I'm gonna just show this here. What we do is we take the, the three, um, sorry, five main outcomes and then four um, mechanisms. And what we're plotting here is the coefficient of interaction between the instrument, this is reduced form, and a dummy indicating above median values for these three metrics that we have. So we divide for every county, we create uh, an index of, just a dummy, whether the county has a both share of income to sales ratio in taxes. The logic is, and when we're following, following an institute, the logic is counties with more, with higher shares of, of income taxes are probably more progressive in general. Sales taxes are aggressive, income taxes are more progressive. So this is just a way to an approximating um, the strength of the safety net, uh, progressivity in taxation. We do the same thing at the state level. And then here we see, okay, what's the share of people, poor people in the state that are covered by another anti-poverty program, which is TAN. And as you can see, the effects are more muted when the counties have an above values of this, right? So the effect of the backlash, the vote for the Republican party is way smaller in counties that have more um, strength, stronger safety nets. Same thing for uh, migration, for poverty, you see that these are different, different measures, but, and they're not that strongly correlated, but they, they capture the same phenomenon, same for universalist values. So, and importantly, we see no effect on crime, despite what, what certain politicians say, unauthorized Mexican migration do not increase crime. Do not increase all crime, violent crime, or property crime. So we knew that that was a lie. Now I can certainly say that that is indeed a lie. Okay, so in conclusion, in response to recent inflows of unauthorized Mexican migrants, we see a consistent conservative response. The voucher for the Republican Party, particularly in the House election increases by around 3.9 percentage points. Local government agencies divest in education and increase relative spending in policing and the administration of justice. And as I said, the reasons behind this response thing are decreasing formal employment in construction and hospital hospitality, which are migrant intensive sectors and increasing poverty. Increasing our migration, decreasing universalist values, more in-group um, or out-group bias, and the effects seem to be weaker in counties with progressive or fair tax structures and more robust safety nets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernesto. Uh, very well done. We are going to have now a very short discussion by Gabriel Chavez. So please, Gabriel, if you want to share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Hey, can you see now? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ernesto, for the presentation and for the paper. It was really nice to read. So I'm just um, going to go over 
a bit of the summary of the paper, the contribution and the strengths. Um, okay, cool. Okay, so the summary of the paper, um, the main question that it tackles is how does an authorized migration from maximum effect political outcomes in the US? And in order to do so, it uses this very nice data and consular IDs of 10 million likely unauthorized Mexican migrants from 2002 to 2018. And the strategy is to leverage this variation across US counties and three four year periods from 2007 to 2018 on recent, on recent unauthorized migrants, combining these with a network's um, ship share instrument uh, using pre period unauthorized uh, share from 2002 to 2006. And then the stocks are calculated using either leave one out strategy or using uh, these push factors, predict stocks that uh, we've seen before. So the results, the main results are that an inflow of unauthorized migrants leads to an increase in the vote share of Republican candidates in both house and presidential elections in one side. And then the other, an increase in expenditure and policy, both in absolute and relative terms, and a decrease in education and expenditure in absolute terms. And then there's a detailed discussion about the mechanisms, including job loss in low skill or um, here I should say actually immigrant intensive sectors, also possibly shifts in, in values, increasing poverty, different tax regimes and out migration. So that will be a, a bit of over view of what the paper is about. So in terms of contribution, I think that there are three main fronts in which the paper contributes. The first one is the question. So um, provides, well, it asks an uh, interesting and timely question, but also provides a well-identified, well, an, a good answer by providing well-identified evidence on the fact of this theoretically and also empirically important group of migrants. Then on the second um, front, which I find uh, particularly very interesting, which is, is the combination of this novel unique data and identification. Um, the data is unique. Well, um, as you can tell, because it tracks unauthorized migrants, which is already quite good over time, which is already, it's yet even more um, amazing. And then it combines both a state of the art um, um, shift share instrument, as well as robust results and mechanisms, which is important for the credibility of the strategy. And then the results are relevant for different strands of literature, I'll say. So first of all, the one that, we touch more closely here, which is migration economics, in particular, the political effects, as well as socioeconomic impact of unauthorized migration. So that's quite interesting on its own because we don't know that much about unauthorized migration. And then there is also this more political economy discussion. Um, and in particular, there's the, this test of intergroup contact, uh, contact that's a typo there, theory by Alport, um, 1954 together with mechanisms. So that's um, a very interesting part um, to be able to um, dissect which are the reasons behind these, um, in this case, um, backlash, political backlash. And in terms of strength of the paper, so, well, first of all, it's a very well-written and clear uh, paper. Um, I recommend you to read. And then secondly, it tackles a timely, very important topic as we have um, witnesses in the, in the witness in the past few years. Um, it's very well motivated and engaging, as you might have seen in the introduction here today in the presentation, but also in the in the draft as well. And then the administrative data on authorized migration over time is quite unique, so that's quite good. And then I think it provides many interesting results that are robust, many robustness checks. Also, it's it's quite nice that the leave one out and the exogenous push factors IP are consistent that uh, increases the credibility. And then the mechanisms are robust to uh, the robustness checks as well. So overall, quite strong. So it was difficult to find uh, things to improve um, in the sense that it's already quite good, but um, I have the following comments. So first of all, the paper touches upon a lot of outcomes. I think that maybe as a job market paper, that's already quite good, but possibly down the road, it could potentially be thought of two different papers, one on the political effects and exploring this job loss mechanism is a be the values, changing values um, mechanism. And then another one on public finance effects through um, taxes, redistribution, expenditure, and also revenues due to this uh, migration shock. 
So that's one point on the framing. The other is to, um, I think, well, I, I guess Ernest, as he said in the introduction, is working on this, but uh, I think it would be nice to put uh, the finger in the mechanisms and be a little bit more formal on what are the contributions of each one, um, say um, some, uh, somewhat um, how much each mechanism explains, what are the relative contributions to the, um, to the, um, to the observed effect. Um, possibly either by saying how much it contributes to the effect or maybe um, explaining how much variance it explains something on those lines. I think a nice recommendation of a recent paper that does something quite new, but possibly it could be investigated is this deep at all paper on the effect of trade shocks on political outcomes in Germany using um, job loss as a mechanism. Uh, they propose this causal mediation analysis that it could be useful to be applied. Um, uh, sometimes during the paper, it reminded me of this deep at all paper, so that could possibly be investigated. And then finally, there's this uh, recent, recent uh, literature on the rise of populism that we've served all over the world. So in particular, this group is particularly interesting for the case of populism in the US or Trump. So I will be interested to see possibly a subsection or uh, let's see what you could do in order to say whether there's an effect on the Trump episode or not. I don't know how feasible that will be, but I think that will be an interesting case of study to investigate along the lines of this paper. And then in terms of the empirical analysis, one thing that I've been thinking um, while I was reading the paper was this uh, native relocation. In particular, you document the positive outflow of these um, losers in terms of people who might uh, so that's more of a hypothesis that the people who live are the losers who might be then voting Republican. So if these people go to other counties and are the losers, um, well, the people who lose their jobs, and then these people, because they are affected, they might um, be driving this political uh, backlash, then you could have an underestimation of the effect. So the effect will be actually larger because these people will be going to control um, counties. So that will be interesting to assess. And then what about inflows? I guess that you might have a zero, well, a known significant effect on inflows, but it will be nice to document as well. And then in terms of empirical analysis, uh, treatment intensity. So this will be interesting to look at nonlinear effect in terms of tipping points. So places where there's already many migrants or unauthorized migrants, see how the effect varies. So maybe it's not linear, maybe in places where there's not so many unauthorized Mexican um, migrants at baseline, the effects are stronger or possibly the other way around. And this could also be related to um, distance to the border. There's places that have um, experienced larger flows historically to um, unauthorized migration, just uh, to be close to the border. It might be interesting to see if the effect is um, driven or not by these places. And then other minor comments um, that I come up with. So first of all, um, you showed in this slide 38, um, this difference on the, on the IV on authorized and authorized migrants. And I wonder why they might differ so much. Uh, the effects differ quite a lot. So I guess they might be quite different. It will be interesting to see how much they differ. And then I did not quite understand why authorized migrants are not so, so well captured by consular IDs. What are the incentives for them to not get the ID? And then how much um, these two interact? Because the results are quite different. So I suspect that not a lot, but um, it will be interesting to know a little bit more about this. And then how much does unauthorized migrants move? Um, in this case, we assume that within period they don't move, but still it might be interesting to look at mobility across periods. And also temporary migration will be an interesting um, outcome to look and then finally um in the in the paper in the in the theoretical section you mentioned these three possible uh, ways by by which there might be a political backlash um the losers that um, lose their jobs or economic losers and then there's heterogeneity slash out group response and the negative perceptions about immigrants so for the last two i'm not that sure i understand what the results inform us about so which of the two might be um, the explanation behind uh, the results that you find. So I will be interested also in seeing more about this discussion. And that's much for that's pretty much all for today. I have more comments, but I uh, we can discuss that um, ourselves. 
So, well, thank you very much, and I look forward for the discussion. Thank you very much, Gabriel. This is this is great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Ernesto, if you want, you can answer some of the comments now, or I can. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just incorporate everything that, that Gabriel said. I think we should be clear in 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 many parts. Um, but no, I mean, I, I don't think. I think it, it might be more productive if I receive more 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 feedback. But points, all of them fantastically taken, and I think they're very insightful, Gabriel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then um, we can open the floor, uh, the, the floor for an open discussion now. I would like to ask you a couple of questions that were on the chat. Uh, first of all, Sarah was wondering how representative are unauthorized, mi una unauthorized migrants who got an insular uh, consular ID for the total sample of unauthorized migrants from Mexico. And she was asking if you have any estimates of what share of all notarized migrants from Mexico get a consular ID, or if you know at what time of entering the US to get the consular ID. Yeah, so, well, in, in partially what we're trying to do with the data validity is that, right? So we're saying, look, we, this, is, this is a population for which not a lot is known in terms of characteristics because it's hard to, it's hard to measure, right? There's there's no record of an authorized uh, Mexican migrant. So we think that the fact that our estimates are very consistent with ACS5 tells us that we're capturing um, a representative sample, um, or we're capturing pretty much the totality, or or near the totality of unauthorized Mexican migrants. Uh, but again, this is just 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 some suggestive evidence we don't we don't really know um because there there's no no um no benchmark right um do you know what are the incentives of migrants getting the consular id yeah well yes good question so two first they cannot uh, get a formal or u.s issued government issued id on like formal migrants so this is part of of uh the response to, to, to Gabriel's question. So authorized migrants um, can get a state issued ID, and that's a formal ID. Unauthorized migrants cannot. And that is important to do basic um, activities in life, like opening a bank account or rent a place. So if you don't have an ID, you cannot do those things. And in many states, formal ID is is a, a, a consular ID is a formal ID, um, and also I think there is a part of uh, a part of it that a, a part of the decision that explains why people um, get IDs is just tradition, right? I think that's that's just how 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 unauthorized migrants uh, do it. Like you just go to the consulate and and, and get an ID. Um, obviously, I don't think that that's the main reason. But I think we should not downplay the fact that that, that uh, it's just uh, like a like a convention. But in that case, if I may, in that case, why legal migrants like authorized migrants would not seek to get the consular ID as well, just as a sense of also I don't know belonging to the Mexican community abroad, even if they have access to the formal state ID. Yeah. Oh, well, th that's what I say. I think for the most part, is the the value of it. Um, I don't know. I, I used to work at the Mexican consulate in Chicago, and I never got one. I was lazy, and I don't know. But uh, I, and also because when I arrived in Chicago, I got a, a driver's license. So you no, know, I, I like never, never really had to. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I should just emphasize that it's way more useful, or or basically only useful for unauthorized migrants and not really for authorized migrants. Uh, there was one comment, sorry, about stocks. Um, so this is the thing about stocks. So it's very hard to measure stocks. The ACS5 through the Social Explorer has, I mean, we can, we, we calculate stocks based on Mexico for, for people that arrived recently, 
it's imperfect and our results are um, significant, remain significant to the introduction of, of stocks. We think that the most relevant stocks are the share of Hispanics in the county. Um, and we see that there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, heterogeneity there. Um, maybe what we can do is just use the subset of 400 counties and really um, you know, test whether the results change uh, because th in those counties, for those counties, we have more reliable data coming from, from IPOMS. But, uh, but in general, we see that, that stocks in the beginning of the period do not really matter, neither our proxy of, of Mexico foreign nationals or Hispanics. Um, I can ask also a quick question. Have you checked any employment and wage analysis by education group within those sectors? Yeah, no, we have to. The problem with doing that, the challenge with doing that, which I think maybe we should just like do it despite of the challenge, is that we have data only for a subset of counties. That's the data that would come from the American Commander Survey right. from IPOMS. And we would have only data for 400 counties. Mm. So we can do it and we can do the effects not only by education, but by demographic, other demographic characteristic. And that would be that would be useful, but but no so far. We don't. Yeah, because like when, when I see the results, I see like employment on on totals is not affected. There are some subsector differences. Wages do not change, but then poverty increases substantially. So I was guessing like who is making that increase? Like if, if supposedly the ones that are losing their jobs perhaps are moving to manufacturing or why is manufacturing increasing? Is there the labor demand or something going on? Because for me, it's, I don't know. I don't know which is the, the story. Yeah, we, we, we think there, there might be some shuffling there, some um, changing between sectors, but um, but yeah, maybe maybe we can, we can do these more in-depth analysis with, the 400 and, and so counties and and look at that. Just confirm that this is formal employment and, and yeah. Yeah, and that, that point is also nice. Like you, we don't have informal employment in the data. So, and I, and I guess, I don't know how is the statistics of how many of these unauthorized immigrants work in the formal sector. There is no info, no, all of that. We we can we can try to get at that with ACS five, but but no no I mean and and these data we think that these data is for the most part formal employment because of the data sources yeah, yeah. social security unemployment but but not entirely so we think this is for the most part that and it's just hard yeah. to know no no but great Ernesto I think it's many things going on I I don't want to bother you more but it's just like focusing on the labor market side. Thank you. Uh, so someone's saying, would it be possible that somehow more support uh, for the GOP is pushing uh, migrants to get the consular IDs as a source of protection? Well, that's what we were trying to test with um, with um, with this. So right, we're, we're saying, look, what happens when we see changes, um, either state level or county level changes that would that we think affect either positively positively or negatively, um, the demand for IDs. So as we saw here, the demand for consular IDs after a state allows IDs to be presented as a document to get uh, a driver's license, the demand is not does not increase systematically. It increases in the short run, but then doesn't really, right? It stabilizes. So the, the state by period fixed effects would take care of this. But this is a state level policy. So what happens with a county level policy? And the only consistent county level policy that we think that could affect the decision is secure communities. So we do an event study with many specifications following many of the leading papers uh, in the literature. And we see that the decision of whether to get an ID after the, co the county um, enrolls or, or participates, starts its participation in secure communities, which is a program that facilitates deportation, does not really change. 
So this is the way, this is the evidence that we have to support the assumption that the demand for consular IDs is rather inelastic. People get IDs because it's useful for them. And, and that's maybe the, the point of just because there is, there is this um, uh, inertia of, of getting IDs. 